Hey, wait a minute. You're not Aaron. <laughs> I'm not Aaron. <laughs> what have you they done with Aaron? Aaron today? This is this is the best news I've had all day. You're not Aaron. <laughs> no, we had to line it up to surprise you. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> exactly. I love it. Well, wherever you are, Aaron, uh, I'm just I'm just kidding, man. I, I love you, Aaron. But uh, hey, Mike, how's it going? I'm doing well, Brian. Yourself? I'm uh, I'm getting over. I've for the last week. I'm doing okay, but I've had this rare tropical disease. You've probably never heard of it. I it's called COVID. I think uh, COVID. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. COVID SAR V three. Yeah, Omicron version. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> it's uh, but 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 doing had a mild case and and doing better, and so and so here we are. We're that's, happy to see that. Yeah probably too much information for most people to tune in, but that's okay. So uh, a new friend in the clubhouse today, Mike, uh, why don't you uh, introduce yourself to the uh, handfuls of people who will watch this video? To the handfuls of people. Yeah, intros are always hard. Talking about yourself is weird. So we'll, we'll do it short. I am a, I'm a crazy engineer physics guy who got an IT by accident, done some stuff from, uh, we'll get the backwards here, jump out of airplanes as a ranger, played trombone, have been all in and out of sales, uh, built a cloud startup company, did that for a while, really cool experience. After that, was a pre-sales engineer and field CTO type for a couple of big companies, done some tours of duty between you know, EMC, pure storage, and most lately, an account manager at Cisco, and then now I'm wrapped up with you crazy people. <clears throat> yeah, and I like to think of you as sometimes account managers, people uh, might you write, write you off as a salesy sort of guy, but I have it on good authority that you're uh, might be a, a step beyond your prototypical sales guy. Like, you know, I don't see it on your wall, but maybe you have some letters to, to prove. Uh, I, I yeah, I went through that CCIE thing. I had quite a few uh, VMware certifications back in the cloud days. I was, you know, judge, jury, and executioner. It was me and a couple other people who had to go build these things. So we had to learn how they actually worked along the way. Oh, cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for thank you for uh, jumping in a, in a pinch today and uh, and subbing for Aaron. And I think, uh, you know, I don't think we I we can... Uh, normally, I get to make fun of Aaron's deficiencies in corporate IT that, he, you know, I don't know what the color or the sky is in his world. I won't be able to take those easy pickings today because I, I think you've got some good experience, uh, good experience with the topic. So anyway, thanks for thanks for joining. I got to ask that, you know, you said trombone. I think I think I see that uh, in the background. You just have a trombone at the ready. Uh, at all times, that's <laughs> it's pretty fantastic. Well, it's it's more I still practice um, against my wife's wishes, so it got <laughs> exiled out to where my office is. Got it. it. It all makes sense. It all makes sense now. Cool. Okay. Well, um, we'll uh, we'll do our our little shtick and and jump right in. I think the I've got the long, wrong picture in our transition video here, but well, whatever. We'll roll with it today. Here we go. Uh, constructive security. All righty. So uh, <clears throat> you weren't with us last week, but last week, we, w the last couple of weeks, we've been talking uh, about New Year's resolutions and getting back to basics. And that's begged the question of what are the basics last week? We talked really, really high level about, you know, okay, well, that sounds good focus on basics, get back to basics, but you know, what are basics? And, um, and I propose that I'm, I'm no like religious advocate of the CIS controls, but I, but I think they have a pretty good, they have a pretty good pattern might be better than going and inventing it yourself. And certainly, and furthermore, we, uh, we decided we were going to roll through um, go ahead and bring this up here. 
make us a little bigger here. Ah, okay, here we go. That we were going to roll through the some of these CIS controls, and helpfully, they have a category of controls, oddly enough, that they call the basic controls. Out of this is back version seven one, where there were where we could correctly call this the CIS top twenty controls. Uh, they've they've mucked with it a little bit in the the latest version, but. So six of the 20 CIS controls under this version of, of CIS are, are labeled as basic. And um, over the next series of weeks, uh, if you do the drill well today, maybe we'll just kick Aaron out of the clubhouse for a while and you can keep, <laughs> keep rolling. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so today we're going to zoom in on one of these inventory and control of hardware assets, or I think I simplify that to hardware uh, uh, asset inventory today. Um, so so zoom in, Riveting. yeah, zoom in on that. All these I feel a little bit like, yeah, it's this it's not what I would call a sexy topic. But uh, I think there's there's good material here. A necessary and, evil. It's a necessary evil, and and kind of as we said, a basic underlying. I think of this as do not pass go, do not collect two hundred dollars. Uh, kinds of, you know, you need to, um, to to just simply do this stuff because it's because it's actually basic. Um, all right, so. Um, Jump, in, jump into this a little bit more. This is actually um, too small to read, but I'm going to go through, um, let me zoom this a little bigger. I'm going to go through this a lot today. I thought we would, would talk about it, but just orienting people to, as I'm talking about the CIS controls, kind of the way we do this. All of this collectively is a blowout uh, and uh, you can go find this stuff. It's you know you don't have to pay to go get the CIS controls material. You can Google as your friend, and and you can go find these the the version seven point one that I mentioned. But they further uh, sort of blow out and illuminate this control. This you know control one is what we're talking about of the basics, the the hardware asset inventory piece, and. So they break that into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different controls. And then further, we talked about this a little bit last time, but they helpfully break those into implementation groups. Uh, and the, the theory being these things, these two that are checked under implementation group one would be things we do sooner rather than later, or you know, even more basic, uh, amongst the basic control, these are the really basic parts of it. And then as you're getting more mature, you know, you could step up to implementation group two and do those additional, you know, it's, you know, both and you can do everything, continue doing everything in group one and add some of the group two things. And then you know, if you're really seeking to be you know, good at this, then you get to uh, implementation group three and, and that, you know, we add, we go from two to six to eight components of, of uh, inventory really, and control. It really does seem simple. It's like learning how to cook. We start with oatmeal, we add some oats and some water, and we boil it, and you can't really mess it up too much. And then after we do that, we're going to try to add some spices, and you've got to kind of learn what goes together. <clears throat> yeah. Well, and we, I mean, can get into like the, we can get into the artisanal dynamics of, like, steel cut oatmeal you know versus uh yeah, <laughs> yeah microwave out of a bag yeah exactly it's all right it's catch you starting off. point oh yeah. no just fo follow the recipe and you'll at least have a, a known good product at the end of it yeah ab no absolutely um so i'm gonna dive into start uh talking and would would love to hear some of your experience but um you know, focus on these two really basic basics, the the two most basic components of of uh, of inven hardware inventory uh, 
hardware asset inventory and and controls, as they said. It's a little more on the inventory on the front end and a little more on the controls part of it. You know, what do I do with that data uh, on the back end? And I would say just by the way, even before this, inventory first, going back to a conversation from one of the prior weeks, not sexy at all and doesn't even necessarily feel um, doesn't feel good to people who are setting off. I'm going to start my journey to secure my company. Uh, and it's like, okay, step one, go get an inventory of everything, you know, going back to a world where, well, no, I'm going to go buy antivirus and firewall. And, you know, what are the things I go buy today to that, you know, inventory isn't gonna, you know, the, the devil's advocate or the, the maybe naive or simple perspective is how's counting things gonna secure me, gonna protect me from Russian hackers. You know, that doesn't feel very good. That feels very weird. I'll, uh, I like to talk a lot, but I'll, I'll ask you that question. Like why from with the Mike Minky perspective, why inventory first? Why is inventory so crucial that I shouldn't, you know, start doing all those other things without inventory? Well, whether you call it brilliant and the basics, slow is smooth, smoother, fast, or just starting from the ground level. You know, think of your basic home, whether you're in business or you're a Fortune 1 IT company. If you don't know how many doors and windows you have, you can't even verify that they're locked or even closed. I mean, it's awesome to say I want laser beam cat eyes to capture intruders as they try to morph through my my panes of glass. But if you don't even know where the window is, you can't aim the cats with lasers. <clears throat> so it's perfectly sensible that I should go at least figure out what I have. Right. And, uh, and there's definitely a journey there. I mean, my, my guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, I, I'd imagine most people, especially if they're a small business, say this sounds like a job for Excel. Yeah, and I, uh, we, were, we were laughing about this a little bit in the lead up to that, but I certainly, you know, coming up as a systems administrator, um, you know, engineer type myself, went through this phase of <clears throat> some decades ago uh, being responsible for a fleet of, of workstations and servers and modems and, um, you know, you know, software as well, all those things that went along with it and lacking a system, you know, came to this frustration point, like, I don't even know what we have. Um, and yeah, looking around for, you know, lacking a better option, whipped up an Excel database, uh, an Excel database, an Excel spreadsheet, um, you know, got real fancy and like, maybe I'll turn this into an access database and, you know, started, <laughs> started trying to build it myself. Um, and, you know, that lasted for, you know, I think I was really diligent about that for several days, you know, maybe even in a week or two. Of, <laughs> and then, you know, kind of lost interest and focus. And, uh, uh, you know, that became just yet another spreadsheet, you know, sitting out there kind of, kind of languishing hey. away. But, and it almost seems like that statement kind of leads into your group too. You know, you can start with the basics, do some manual processing. And it sounds like you acknowledge that entropy won pretty quick. It takes some effort to keep those things going. Yeah. And I, I think we would all agree that long-term, any, any human-based mm -hmm. process is destined to fail. There's got to be some form of automation at, at scale. Yeah, I will say, I mean, before we jump straight to implementation group two, I want to I wanna wallow in this group one a little bit, which is I think that problem of languishing, I have seen very expensive asset management systems, people that we, do, we don't dwell a lot in products uh, on this show, but I've seen people that bought really, really expensive service desk packages with CMDB, you know, uh, uh, configuration management database, essentially, you know, the, the industry vertical level, what's the name of that database I should buy to go stuff this information into. 
that also is sitting there languishing, not updated, completely inaccurate, not usable for any, you know, so, so service now can be just as, you know, poorly maintained as my spreadsheet was back uh, in the late nineties, um, you, you know, and so, you know, it's, it's not even so much that. And I would also say um, there's something to be said for sure, you know, we'll get into the automation and the instrumentation and you got to automate uh, some things to, to get to a level of success. But I, I think the piece that I would add in this group is to also not ignore the human processes. So I think what makes this hard is that one of the things that makes this hard is that I've seen a lot of people go by, whether it's on this naively on the spreadsheet side of things, or even if they go by the automated tools and the high-end database to store the information in. I think what's important in here is that there is there is some human element, <clears throat> which is um, things that I've seen help be successful down at this level of you, you will need an inventory. You know, I mean, you will need to identify where you're going to store this stuff. And um, I don't recommend spreadsheets or even homegrown databases, but I have seen people be very successful with homegrown you know, it, it can be done, actually. It's it's not the best for the super long term, maybe, to have to, you know, maintain your own customized database. But I've seen people do it successfully. And when I've seen them do it successfully, it's that they understand that it's not, uh, oh, I'm going to stand this thing up and then I'm done. But it requires care and feeding. It requires looping in all the human processes. So, you need to be prepared to go and work with your service desk and say, I don't want to have rely on human beings for all this, but I do want to make sure that anytime a human being touches an asset, that there's a built-in mechanism and there's a built-in process and there's a built-in policy to say, when thou touchest an asset, you know, you are part of the asset inventory control that I'm not going to rely only on the human beings, but I am going to budget some time in my processes to say, when you work on a service desk and you connect with somebody to work on their computer, if their computer is assigned to the wrong person, fix that right there and then. Or like, oh, uh, you know, a piece of, you know, a, a configuration of this thing has changed, you know, like our scanning software didn't pick up the fact that, you know, you've got a different version of Windows or, you know, you've got a new major peripheral, like, you know, have the system set up in such a way, have the processes set up in such a way that you gotta, you gotta address that there in flight. And again, I, I kind of pointed this, but the policy and procedure has to support all that stuff, so. I guess it makes sense when you have that, that as a business, and most businesses grow, right? I think the idea is nobody wants to stagnate, that part of that process is to go back and reevaluate your process. What yeah. worked, what didn't work? How can yeah. we add efficiency? Have we, outgr have we outgrown what we've been doing? Yeah. I think the other thing here, and down in here, um, I've seen also some of the disconnect between IT leadership or, you know, the people that strategize and fund for technology and the people that actually do the work hands-on, that some of the failures of these systems are um, the ability to maintain the information is not made available to the people who could maintain the information. Uh, the, or uh, another ch kind of challenge that the system is too hard to use for like to use this data in the way that it should be used. Like we'll know we're doing this well when the people who interact with assets can maintain it. We'll know that we're doing this well when we're looking around and making business decisions like security business decisions. And we say, where am I going to get the data to make this decision? It's like, oh, it's in my asset inventory, you know, like that it's a measure of success in this of, 
this information is either a, a chore that I simply do to serve the chore or, you know, it rises to the level of I'm doing it uh, such that like, no, that's like super valuable data to me. And, you know, the finance people are like, I need this for our projections. The security people are like, oh, this helps me drive uh, our decision making, those sorts of things. Okay, I, I beat it up, uh, I think. IG one. Anything you'd add? I, I mean, I think it's the the elephant in a room. One dot six is starkly more difficult than one dot four. Yeah. You know, buying and paying money for assets is pretty easy to want to track them. Trying to identify when somebody is on or or a device is on your network that you maybe didn't put through that <clears> process <throat> is a different art all on its own. Yeah. Well, and I would say one six. There are other controls. I think you can put a lot into one six, like, oh, okay, I need a system to go and hard code this and force that. That's actually addressed in different portions of this. <coughs> one six to me is is actually both more simple and a little more difficult in some ways. It's the certainly are you looking for unauthorized assets, you know, connected to your network? But to me, it's almost one six. This addressing it is almost more like, no. Do you do you actually have the processes and the policy and even the sort of organizational will to go do something about that? Um, because I've seen lots of environments where people could go out and figure at least figure out. You know, I don't know if this is authorized or not, but especially in smaller organizations, I found of like, this doesn't seem right. Even in bigger organizations, I've been, you know, there are network people who are like, what is this thing? You know, like literally what is this thing that is plugged into my, to my network? Uh, or, you know, some new system is purchased by some department and it is just plugged in. Um, and, you know, you can view this as a systems problem, but I think it's a process and organizational problem is what, I've seen IT departments struggle with of like, what do I do with that? And, um, you know, I'd like to give ready, easy answers, but it's like, no, exactly. What do you do with that? And, you know, having governance, having a, a way you can talk about the exceptions or the one-offs and get them approved or denied. No, uh, involving cybersecurity in this discussion. Okay. If I ha have no choice but to plug it in, what's the exception process I use to say, well, here are the conditions under which we'll say yes. Like, yes, you can plug it in, but not to that network into this other one and only with these controls. And, you know, it needs to be patched this way and those sorts, you know, creating, maybe not saying yes or no or having an automated piece of software turn it off, but knowing what to do when those exceptions occur is how I think about one sex. Cool. And that makes sense. You know, the small, smallest company just shut all your ports off and you have to ask permission to turn it on. You yeah. Know, big companies probably need some fancy software. Yeah, correct. Well, and even getting to that level of, you, you kind of mentioned this, uh, I'm going to jump on here in this second group. Now we're, you know, some of these are going to be at that dividing line of, depending on what kind of company you are, you might say, this is not a basic, Brian. This feels like, rocket science and other kind of companies it's like it's it's technically we can pull it off but you know it's complicated uh kinds of things but like i look here at one seven uh deploy port level access control and they, they talk about it you know 8021 x is the big control there but in smaller companies you know to me the basic version of that could be do you leave your all of your ports activated all the time <laughs> Uh, and sure. connected to a default LAN that's, you know, the live production LAN, or, you know, do you, um, do you have some network segmentation and the default, you know, conference room LAN is not, doesn't get you into the data center basically, um, you know, such that you don't set up your network in such a way that somebody in a sub department, somebody in marketing could go by a server on the download and plug it in under their desk <laughs> as a space heater, you know, also serving up their application or whatever. Um, and, and those sorts of things. But um, so this is uh, 
you know, implementation group too. So going beyond, okay, I've got some sort of system and I have the processes and policies around, you know, what do I, what are uh, acceptable assets on my network? What are uh, exceptional or maybe unacceptable assets on my network? What are the processes and policies around all that? Now I, I start getting into some of that, you know, what I think of as a little more complicated, but, you know, automation controls. So one here, they say utilize an active discovery tool. So, um, well, you know, tell me a little bit about that. What's, uh, you know, what do you think about that one? Well, I mean, I, well, so I'll, I'll pick on Cisco cause I came from Cisco, but I mean, I see this list of things right here and immediately I'm thinking of identity services engine. Or if you look at a competitor to that, I mean, there's a whole bunch out there. Maybe yeah. it's for Scout. Do I have an ability to know when something comes on the network, whether the company owns it, whether they don't own it? And what what ability do I have for my underlying infrastructure that's maybe not directly tied to security? Can I leverage to figure out where that person belongs on my network? Right. Um, and the I guess the good and the bad of that is you can go as complicated as you need or as simple as you need. Right. You know, I know Fortune 100 companies that still don't have 802.1x fully rolled out. But I know companies of 10 people that they did it from day one. Right, right. Yeah. Well, and this is the, the like you say, 802.1x, um, you know, so, so bringing, you know, like, uh, you know, crypto and certificates to do I even let you plug into the network, basically adding or adding a level of device identity to, you know, pr you don't just plug in and get uh unfettered access to everything it's you know how do you get uh how do you identify yourself as an as an approved asset to get plugged into the network i think the places where i've seen it configured it's like the company of like yeah we've configured that out and we're really really close to turning that on any day now you know we're about a month or two away. I, I know way too many companies that have been a month or two away from turning on 802.1x for several years now. <laughs> like, it's like it's like the mainframe that was going away a decade ago. Yeah, right. Exactly. And I why th that's one. Why do you why do you find that is uh, that is that way? I mean, I have some of my own theories, but why is what's so hard about 802.1x or you know port level access? I think it really. Control? I think it really goes back to the previous slide of, you know, entropy has won. People don't know what they have. And the fear of taking somebody offline, interrupting business critical services by making changes that you don't know what the effect is going to be. Yeah. And there have been several companies that have tried to roll this out and they don't realize that, okay, I've got a, I've got a laptop that's out on my shop floor that I don't have joined to the domain, but has been critical to some device working or it's plugged into a PLC because joe smith out on the assembly line needs to use this and i've just taken it offline and it could be other things as simple as um and i'll pick on manufacturing because we find this all the time there's as many netgear switches as there are actual managed devices people need more ports they plug them in they've never done the proper way to mitigate those things being added and you look at your spreadsheet or your cmdb or your itsm tool and you think you have it and it's kind of a destructive mechanism to to find that you don't Right. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I've, I have a lot of healthcare background and for us, it was always, you know, it's that risk of like, you start down this path, but, um, you know, coming up, coming closer and closer to that day of, you know, when I implement this, something that doesn't have the configuration to do 802.1x is either going to get kicked off the network or it's going to be put on a you know, a different network that has sort of different sort of policies and behaviors. And that's a, that's a super scary thing for people that, that unknown, um, kind of known unknowns of, I'm going to flip this switch one day and everything's going to go to, going to go to hell in a handbasket or, you know, people that like, yeah, we built that out and we tried that and we turned it off 30 minutes later. Uh, you know, because it created chaos, but we're, you know, again, it kind of, to me, proves out of the technical part of it is one part of the challenge, but it's an organization, you know, force of will, policy and procedure, like 
if we step back and say, you know, what does it say that I have all these devices that I know so little about how they function that like, you know, we, we, we can't back away. We can't continuously just back away from that challenge because it's hard. Like, you know, um, I think a, a trend you see is, is it's pretty easy to implement wireless 802.1x. I mean, the people joining your wireless network are going to be people. Those those are easy to identify. We have domains and Active Directory, and we can identify corporate assets. You know, it's the next step of easiness is people can manage certificate management and say, okay, now I now have a corporate asset that's domain joined, and I have an authorized certificate. Versus Mike Minky brought his personal laptop in, and okay, well, his Windows password isn't going to let him on this network today. It's the the wired aspect of it, yeah. um, especially I, I would imagine healthcare is a lot like manufacturing. I might have something buried in the back of an x-ray room that's been there for 25 years yep. and like nobody really knows what it is other than it's needed. Yeah. Or, and even to get to that level of, to know what it is, you know, first of all, even at rudimentarily identify what is this, but then the, to predict the network behaviors and say, not only what is it, what is it, but what does it need to connect to, um, and and that and that sort of thing. And it's you know building out a skill set to say, how does this need to be configured from a network standpoint? What would it need to connect to? As importantly, what does it not need to connect to? And it seems like we're just not progressing on that. And this all adds up to our collective inability to do that draws a straight line to me, just oh, by the way, to why ransomware was so successful in, in 2020 inside of organizations. Because this death by a thousand cuts of, I don't know all the things I have. I don't know how they plug together. I, you, know, you, you said it very eloquently, but it's the... I can't secure what I don't know about, what I can't see, you know, what I can't count. I, I don't even know where to begin. My my inability to know where to begin results in a continuing model of, well, just plug it all together and don't touch it. Um, but, you know, that creates these big sprawling networks where a bad guy getting in on you know, the Sally Sue Smith in marketing's workstation has unfettered access to everything uh, because, you know, without without greater knowledge, we can't build our networks in any other way. It's uh, it's rough. Anything else, uh, you know, we're coming, coming to time, but, you know, anything else on this list that jumps out at you is interesting? I mean, number one, I mean, I think everything we're talking about is the reason an active discovery tool is so important. Uh, I mean, how many times you go to a customer and you implement something they can discover what's in the network and like, huh, I didn't know that was still there. Yeah. I thought we got rid of that three years ago. Or what is this guy? Why do we have a Raspberry Pi in the basement of building seven? <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, it, this... it seems like the CIS organizes fairly well. If you stop from the start from the top and go down and you take that approach, you'll, you'll get yeah. there. Uh, this to me, the active discovery tool, the concept of active is that there's some piece of software, there's some system that actively scans around the network and either with using credentials or sometimes uncredentialed, you know, just basic network port and protocol scans, but it goes and finds, you know, things on the network. And this is, you know, we don't get a lot into product names, but, um, you know, in addition to, um, you know, some of the network stack vendor, you know, stuff that you mentioned, um, you know, this to me is SolarWinds, PRTG, uh, ServiceNow, in addition to have a database, has a scanner. A company like Tanium has a very, you know, very high end, but, you know, very thorough kind of engine. Um, Land Sweeper, you know, more you know, small mid-market companies I've seen use that a lot. Uh, Manage Engine it has a system that some people use. BMC used to be Remedy, has, you know, track it and has some functionality to to do this sort of stuff. But again, you know, actively going around and, and scanning the 
the network. The DHCP one is interesting to me too. And I will say, you know, there have been times in my uh, career early on where I lacked for tools that, you know, don't underestimate the, in terms of the looking around for, you know, even if you don't have full automation to tie it to, um, to tie an automate, you know, go do a lookup, but the, on the, you know, plugging in and wireless network, it all comes back, all those devices ended up needing to get IP addresses. And so those DHCP logs where things are going getting IP addresses, just even to comb through that and say, what's coming online on my network and, and where, and just even, you know, based on <clears throat> naming schemes, based on, well, that's a very weird, you know, the manufacturer of that, hardware a mac address is like that's not normal uh for my environment and Ed, if nothing else budget some time and cycles to you know either have a system that that you know plugs that together and identifies the exceptions or to budget some time to deal with weirdness if you're on the very very early uh side of things that's that's kind of an in interesting one but cool um here last, you know, I will get into, I'll just mention this. I think we're definitely in implementation group three that we're kind of getting, these are important. Uh, and while the control is basic, you know, I, again, this is implementation group three. I think this is more advanced stuff, but so passive versus active, this is more, um, you know, things, um, you know, I think things that are here are that are on a span port more quietly listening at the center of the network and identifying oddness. So, uh, you know, this to me gets into the, and I think in the Cisco world, it was like stealth watch, NetFlow, NetFlow analysis. Yeah. That, you know, that kind yeah, of thing. Land but, Cove stealth watch and, you know, leave the Cisco to change the name. I couldn't even tell you what the name this week is, but they did change it again. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, and then, um, yeah, like we said here, uh, client certificates to authenticate hardware assets. And again, you know, depending on the kind of company you are, th this might be in your uh, kit of basics, but, you know, here's where, you know, you're getting to this level, you're nailing it. But I'd also remind and think that, you know, if you aren't doing implementation group two, you're going to, uh, group one, you're going to str struggle to do implementation group two and, you know, kind of. If you're not doing one one, it's going to be hard to do one three, and you know progressively as you go on, and uh, hard to do implementation group three if you aren't doing one and two. So those are so to bring it full circle. Start with the Quaker oats and water. Yeah, exactly. I love it. Cool. Well, uh, good discussion today. Appreciate you uh, jumping in in a pinch. Thanks Any... for have me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is fun. Let's do it. A... Let's do it again sometime. Thanks, Brian. Awesome. Cool. Well, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let that be that, uh, for this time next week. Uh, I think it's, I think it's same sort of stuff, but we're going to talk about software next time. So, uh, see, see who joins us. May, you know, maybe it'll be you and Aaron next time. I don't know. We'll, we'll <laughs> see what happens. Thanks. See ya.